public have the right to know? Okay, I have to accept it. Are you recording now? Uh, yes. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I think we're. Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the seminar, and it's my pleasure to introduce Henrique uh, Sal Erp from University de Campinas, uh, speaking on harmonic sp2 invariant g2 structures on the seventh sphere. Thank you, Carolyn, and the other organizers for this invitation. Um, I should also say uh, that this is. Uh, uh, this talk covers a joint work with Eric Lubo, Andres Moreno, and Juliet Saavedra. And with special thanks to uh, Jorge Lauret. So, so I should say from the outset, this, this project was motivated by a very productive visit um, uh, we did to Cordoba in 2019. And it's largely inspired by some of the insights uh, Jorge uh, shared with us. So I, I don't know if he's in the audience, but that's, uh, that's with thanks, uh, especially to him. So the issue at hand is to try and understand homogeneous G2 structures on the seventh sphere. And uh, uh, specifically, uh, these are sort of more qualitative questions which are going to give precise meaning and, and, um, and, and try and answer along the talk. Uh, it, uh, I should also mention that all of this is on a preprint on the archive, 2021 can be found there for further details. So the, the issue of uh, describing um, G2 structures uh, on homogeneous spaces, um, very least up to isometric class um, is not new. And in, in fact, some uh, descriptions of, uh, of um, of these structures uh, uh, have already appeared in the literature, but they're basically so most notably in the works of uh, Munir and Le and, uh, and Heidegger. Uh, however, these descriptions are, are usually at the infinitesimal level, right? So um, they mostly um, try and quantify degrees of freedom in the description of isometric classes of, uh, in particular here, G2 structures, on homo uh, homogeneous G2 structures. And what we propose to do at this level is to provide a complete parametrization, not just in terms of infinitesimal deformations, but as uh, uh, in providing a, a full space of parameters to describe these uh, homogeneous structures and then the, to, to find explicit representatives in each isometric class. Uh, Furthermore, uh, as these are uh, in particular uh, 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 homogeometric uh, structures, then there's theory which I developed with Eric Lubo, uh, based incidentally on insights by other folks from Argentina, from Cordoba, uh, um, and, 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 and some, some Spanish folks about harmonicity. Um, so we, 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 we have a good notion of harmonic geometric structures uh, in terms of the natural Dirichlet energy defined by the torsion. And we ask ourselves in particular whether there are harmonic representatives in each isometric class. It turns out that the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy uh, in this context is isometric, right? So it varies G2 structures and indeed, uh, um, yeah, it varies G2 structures within isometric classes. But, but when I say isometric classes, one should keep in mind that the G2 structure defines a metric. So that, that's what we mean. So G2 structures are isometric so long as they define the same Riemannian metric uh, on the old manifold. And then of course, uh, uh, since we have a, 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 this notion of harmonicity induced by a natural energy function, then can we actually solve it uh, by uh, standard techniques thinking of reducing this sort of morally parabolic PDE uh, into an ODE and then taking it from there. So these are, there's, there's a sort of algebraic preliminary discussion and then there's an analytic perspective after that. So let's talk about 
homogeneity two structures on the seventh sphere, thought about as SP2 uh, over SP1, then we'll discuss uh, how these fit into isometric classes. And then from the analytic perspective, discuss their harmonicity and stability, meaning second variation properties, and then some further comments. So in Reidegel's classification, uh, um, the seventh sphere can be seen among others as uh, sp2 over sp1. And then one quantifies the um, degrees of freedom defining homogeneous uh, G2 structures uh, by ten, some more like 10 dimensional space. Um, and in particular, the, the distinct isometric classes are organized along seven degrees of freedom, seven dimensions, if you will. But again, this is done at a sort of infinitesimal level, thinking about deformations of these structures and a precise parametrization for the actual spaces is one of the contributions we propose. So let's look at that in a little more detail. So uh, homogeneity two structures uh, based, well, homogeneous, whenever I want to look at homogeneous structures, we look at a reductive pair. So in this case, SP1, uh, we're going to denote by P the uh, reductive complement of SP1 in SP2. The rest of the notation is kind of standard. Um, all I want to, uh, you to keep in mind is that P then is going to naturally split into three one-dimensional bits and one four-dimensional bit, um, which we're going to denote by P1, 2, 3, and then P4. So now, because they're homogeneous, then it suffices to describe them at the the algebra level. So these are the add invariant positive three forms on the Lie algebra, I mean, on, on P. And the action here, the add action is just the canonical covariant action. So H acts by pulling back by its inverse. Now, I'm not going to delve too much into proofs, but just so that you keep in mind, several facts about, about this uh, space. Um, we find to be easier to prove with the equivalent formulation in which we think of G2 structures as a cross product form P. And then by using the elementary uh, formulae for P and elementary properties of, of uh, cross products, then uh, uh, we can work out just with easy linear algebra. Uh, uh, so all the proofs underlying this presentation are done, sort of, substantial number of, of proofs are done using properties of the cross product, okay? So in particular, in this space before, we identify these three special two forms, omega one, two, and three, and we package all of them together into a general expression of a three form defining a G2 structure with 10 natural degrees of freedom. So if you've never heard the expression G2 structure before, it's just a cross product in seven dimensions, right? So we're going to package these coefficients into a matrix, which we call D inverse. There's a reason for it to be called inverse. Um, but so uh, basically, uh, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about the Riemannian metric induced by a G2 structure, it's just defined by this bilinear expression here. So you just contract your fellows with uh, the G2 structure and then you complete dimensions with the three form once again to get a multiple of the volume form. And that, that defines your bilinear form. Uh, in terms of the degrees of freedom I just showed you, then positive definiteness implies that both the first coefficient A sitting there and the determinant of this matrix of coefficients have to be positive. Now, just applying the above relation to this 
circumstance gives you a direct expression for the induced inner product. Then we fix an orientation just by deciding that both A and that D inverse and the determinant have to have the same sign. That's fixing an orientation, okay? You don't have to memorize this expression. It's not going to be on the test. But just believe me that with this deg de these degrees of freedom, we can express the Riemannian metric associated to this, to, to these data. Uh, furthermore, we can write down natural expression for the volume. And now we propose that the uh, with, with these degrees of freedom in mind, then this 10 dimensional uh, space parameterizes uh, variant, ad invariant G2 structures, right? So um, it, it, it will boil down to understanding how much information we can extract and how much uh, uh, it involves uh, uh, implicit symmetries. I would try and understand this matrix, which is determined by the degrees of freedom of this, this, uh, this description. Any other G2 invariant, well, ad invariant G2 structure can be expressed from the model G2 structure, which is the right hand rule, right? It's the canonical in a product, the cross product, vector cross product in R7 by an action of this type. So indeed we have this map, this map of fat phi, which gives an explicit parameterization of the ad invariant positive three forms, which indeed correspond to homogeneous G2 structures on the sphere. And this is explicit. Right? This is not an infinitesimal description. This is a description that assigns indeed coordinates. Yes, it assigns parameters for global description of, of uh, invariant three forms. So that's the that's first achievement, I would say. Then this allows us to make the discussion more precise and delve into isometric classes of these. So if two G2 structures indeed have the same uh, associated by linear form above, then they're, they're said to be isometric. Uh, an instigating question, which I'm not going to respond is, is there a non-homogeneous structure induces the same homogeneous Riemannian metric? This is maybe someone in the audience, maybe we can discuss this during the questions. Um, I, I would be interested in thinking about this question. Uh, whichever way we go about this, then uh, what, what you find is indeed that, um, being isometric can be translated into a relation between the 10 dimensional set of parameters describing each of these. So in particular, the first sort of scalar degree of freedom has to coincide and the matrices D have to differ by an element of SO3. So what this is saying is that isometric classes in this context are three spheres. They are copies of SO3, right? So the SO3 family. So now, uh, modulo isometry then, we are left with seven uh, uh, degrees of freedom describing distinct isometric classes. Uh, and um, by diagonalizing the uh, original, uh, 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 so we, 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 we write down this sort of moral square of the matrix D, diagonalize it, and then by extracting its eigenvalues, uh, we, the, essentially these eigenvalues are going to describe, and essentially because this, we're still going to factor something out of this, but the eigenvalues essentially parameterize distinct isometric classes. So you can think of R1, R2, and R3 as describing, uh, uh, as, parameterize, as, as you're parameterizing the variations from distinct along distinct isometric classes. And of course, there's, there's a last degree of freedom, which is a square root of the determinant, but we can think of this as a some sort of global scale, right? It only intervenes as a scale in this uh, block uh, coming from uh, the subspace P4. And uh, uh, we are going to um, scale it away by a global homothetic transformation. So we can essentially assume that R4 is equal to one, I just by fixing a sort of global scale for the problem. Looking into more detail, 
elements of uh, SP1 are identified with matrices in SO3 by a well-known relation uh, encompassed here. And then we can uh, reverse the above expression and, and write A and D in terms of these eigenvalues and the global scale by means of these expressions. So this goes both ways. And we can now think of the, our G2 structures as parametrized by R4, which in some sense, uh, and, and some element V. So these in principle fix the isometric class and then H is an de internal degree of freedom among isometric structures, right? So all of this becomes explicit. Good. Now, as I told you, just setting our full to one corresponds to a global sort of homotopy. So by, by fixing, say, a preference on volume, uh, we can uh, get rid of our four and think of a one, a two, and a three as the genuine sort of degrees of freedom parameterizing different isometric classes. Uh, and then we can write down just what the representatives are. So a typical, typical element in this isometric class has then this form, and it varies by our choice of H in uh, SP1. Good. Um, interesting offshot of this is if we uh, reconcile uh, this language with Bryant's uh, so-called RP7 bundle formula. So whenever you ask Robert Bryant how he thinks about G2 structures, he's probably gonna say something very insightful and complicated and using the expression RP7 bundle. And um, so in particular, uh, Bryant uh, in his famous formula uh, describes uh, isometric G2 structure, relates uh, isometric G2 structures by degrees of freedom quantified by a function in a vector, essentially a section indeed of a natural RP7 bundle of the manifold. Uh, so we ask what, what would be the homogeneous version of this formula, so in, in our context. So for SP2 invariant uh, G2 structures, any two of them, so let me call fat R the compounded uh, uh, label uh, given by a, a choice of eigenvalues parameterizing a given isometric class. And then any other isometric G2 structure will differ from it morally by an element H in uh, SO3, but we can make this much more precise. Uh, we can in fact uh, achieve a, a complete expression of this so uh, this SO3 uh, variation can be understood in terms of uh, adding variant vector field and uh, unit vector field indeed and a uh, function H0. So the first sort of real part, the real part of this original quaternion, okay? So this is an instance of Bryant's formula and it will be useful in further manipulations. Sorry, um, what was X? I, I forgot the, the vector field. Oh, oh yes, X is a vector field in a manifold. Here it is, okay. Oh, I see. But not just any vector field. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very precise and nice vector field, which is away from P4, right? It's in the first part. Uh, I see. Okay. So X knows the eigenvalues of the moral square of the original matrix D. X knows the imaginary part of the quaternion, which is varying along the, the isometric class. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. And the real part of your quaternion still shows up in the formula. It's, it's, the, it's the function. So together, X and H0 our section of the RP7 bundle, but in a homogeneous set. Good. So now we may say the above expression is too horrific. And uh, if we want to proceed, especially do analyses on these fellows, we should probably find some sort of particular ansatz that makes the situation more symmetric. And indeed, let's make that choice. 
let's choose the three eigen situation in which uh, all three eigenvalues are some some r to the convenient power. And uh, at the end of the talk, time allowing, I can discuss sort of qualitatively how it would go by choosing two or, or the three of them to be distinct. But the point here is that with this ansatz, we can realize just all, all the distinct isometric classes and already perform some non-trivial analytic study. So uh, just by, by choosing this peculiar setting, uh, sort of diagonal setup, uh, we can already achieve quite a bit. Well, in this case, all the above expressions simplify, most noticeably, uh, bear in mind, what we're doing now is fix an isometric class because we're fixing, uh, uh, by fixing R, little r, we're fixing simultaneously all three eigenvalues, so we're fixing an isometric class, and then it's isometric, it's corresponding isometric family is uh, just parameterized by H, so by this unit, this unit okay? Uh, good. Uh, Enrique? Yes. Enrique? Yes, Jorge. Hi. May I ask you? Hi. Yes, please. Hi, how are you? All right. Um, yeah, the, the, this curve of metrics, GR, for R equal to, there are two R's for which GR is an Einstein metric, right? Yes. And what about the phi, the corresponding phi R's? Are special when the metric is Einstein in some sense? Thank you for asking me this. Give me two slides and I'll go back to your question. Great, thank yes, you. Yes, of course, of course. Of, of course, that's, that's, that's what you want to ask, right? That's, of course, that's the good question. In fact, I think that's the question you asked us uh, two years ago. So, uh, so here it is, here it is. What we want, what, what Jorge is calling a special is um, G2 structures with, uh, with um, particularly simple Torsion. So we're going to have to look at the torsion of this uh, geometric structure and try and look at particular torsion regimes, which are noticeable, right? So we can do that. The torsion forms associated to phi r can be computed by, by standard process and they are defined by four, if you wish, quantities uh, called tau zero, a scalar, tau one, a vector type formula, uh, um, objects, tau two, a two form, and tau three, three form. And indeed, uh, uh, the full torsion tensor seen as a two tensor can be expressed in this way. And we can compute in separate each of these torsion forms. There are some identifications here. I don't want to spend time on them. If you've worked with them in the past, you know what they are. If you haven't, you will just be bored. So just bear with me. Uh, these, these, this, this J is an isomorphism and so on. So just so that everybody sits inside two forms in a, in a competent way. So now uh, we just compute, just compute these torsion components. And then we can try and find when these fellows for which choices of R. So R now is sort of parameterizing within our ansatz uh, uh, decision, it's parameterizing the uh, different isometric class. And uh, we can look at which uh, regimes of R and H would produce uh, interesting phenomena. This can all be read of these quantities. So let's do that and then answer uh, all his questions. So indeed, so what we know already each of these uh, isometric classes for each choice of R, we have, a, we have an S3 family, which is just a copy of SO3 parameterized by R, which we call BR, let's say, determining a distinct isometric class. And then go to the equator, and with the benefit of hindsight, maybe we should have noted, uh, denoted all the coordinates differently just to have the zero at the third instead of the second. But then when we realized that it was too late to change and it would be such a bother to do all the computations again. So let's just assume that we're, we're taking the equator in which the H2 is zero inside this S3 family. And then of course we have the north and south poles uh, relative to this same equator. 
these would be a noticeable set. So when I say the equator, that's the equator. I mean, when I say the poles, these are the poles, I mean. And then what you find is that in each isometric class, you're going to find this, the, the following noticeable uh, G2 structures. So uh, a co-closed G2 structure is so-called when it's Hodge dual, the Hodge dual of the three form here, we call it Psi, uh, is closed. The structure is called closed when it's, I mean, closed as a three form. It's called co-closed when it's Hodge dual of Psi, the four form is closed. And it would be torsion free if both were to be closed simultaneously. But these are very hard to find. So the special torsion regimes uh, in this language become the following. So all co-closed G2 structures correspond for, for a given value of R, they are precisely, right, precisely the equator and the poles, right? So you have an S3 sphere describing an isometric class of which the equator and the poles are co-closed. Among these, the ones Jorge seems to like the most, so do I. The so-called nearly parallel G2 structures, the torsion of which is even more special, uh, it turns out they are realized for a particular choice of R, um, in which case uh, we obtain the, 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 the round metric on the sphere, and then, then these uh, occur along the equator. And for a different value of R, these are uh, the, the um, squashed, so-called squashed metric on the seventh sphere occurs on both the poles, okay? So even though the comment here is that even though the round metric on the sphere was previously known and, and the squashed metric, so these are the sort of two distinct metrics on the seventh sphere, uh, what we seem to find here is that they all fit in a family, right? So, so they all fit, uh, uh, they all fit in a in a in a in a same S three family, uh, by, by by means of this description, they are just uh, particular loci on uh, um, on the three sphere, corresponding to a very precise uh, uh, prescribed radius, uh, well scale, right? You can find these constants just by seeing. You know, it's, it's nothing complicated to it. You're just looking at terms of type R cubed minus one. You know, and so so it's um it's easy to kind of see that these would be particularly uh, uh, you know special at uh, values relating to the square root of two, right? So the two nearly parallel G two structures correspond to the equator and the poles in different S three spheres. So if you think if we think about this as a cylinder of S three families along the R direction, then indeed these special metrics occur in the same four-dimensional family, different regions along this four-dimensional family. Furthermore, you can ask the torsion to be super extra special being what's called locally conform or co-closed. Uh, these only occur uh, when all the eigenvalues are one, and then it's the standard Model. That, that, that there will be no further locally formal or closed um, homogeneous G2 structures. Um, and furthermore, there are zero, there are absolutely no locally conformal closed, which are the cousins of these uh, for the other components of torsion or purely co closed. By the way, all this language uh, derives from the classification of G2 structures by the torsion components dating back to uh, Gray and and Marisa Fernandez and people have thought about this with care. Okay, so what I find interesting about this, uh, when I'm not telling you of the existence of any new types of metrics exotic, we're just providing a narrative in which they all fit uh, uh, as particular instances of the same description. Are we good, Jorge? Do you want to do you want to to, to dig in on this? Oh no. Okay. Now, let's do some for the second half of the talk. Let's discuss some some analysis. 
So the natural Dirichlet energy of a geometric structure can be defined on a compact manifold just by means of its torsion. Uh, if we specialize this, I mean, the, the general theory for functional of this type and the sort of conclusions one may derive that that, that, that's in my uh, somewhat recent work with uh, Eric Lubo. But uh, if we specialize this to the homogeneous case and furthermore to S7, uh, um, we, we, we can make the study very precise and completely understand its gradient flow. So, um, the critical points of such an energy are described by um, this equation. So it's the divergence of torsion, torsion seen as a two tensor. So it's divergence is contraction of its derivative. So it's a one tensor can be thought of as a vector field. Okay. And then the natural gradient flow associated to it uh, is just defined by contracting this vector field with the full form so that we get a variation three form and we vary along that direction. That's the gradient flow of, of, of Dirichlet energy. It's a harmonic flow. And indeed, the whether you think of it as a harmonic flow stemming from this regional energy or whether you think of it as an isometric flow uh, in terms of uh, G2 structures that define the same metric, whichever way you choose to go, you find the same dynamics. Uh, and uh, Quite a bit has been understood about these already. So there's work by Duvedi, Karyanis, Nayotis, um, uh, doing a, 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 I mean, a thorough, uh, a, a thorough investigation of this uh, from the isometric picture. Also work by Gregorian and Bagalini proving uh, uh, um, various properties of this. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, since uh, the, our G2 structures can be expressed in terms of a vector field and a function, then we can decouple this gradient flow into a pair of equations describing the dynamics of the function and the vector field apart. In any case, uh, using our previous computations of torsion, then in particular its divergence can be explicitly found. And so harmonicity can be understood by, by inspection, right? You can just find the critical set of the energy function by, by direct inspection, finding that uh, in each isometric class, the families corresponding to, well, always this famous uh, reference, a uh, locally conformal uh, closed family uh, parameterized by one. And then for each value of R, we have the equator and the poles as critical points of the energy function. So look at that. So the equator and poles, which we found to be noticeable because they have special torsion, they turn out to be a harmonic uh, 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 three forms and for G2 structures. And if that's the case, then you can expect gradient flow lines to flow from one to the other. So uh, geometrically, you can think about uh, a flow on S3 that is either going from the equator to the poles or the other way around. And, the, the, and because we can reduce this to an ODE with this description in terms of function and vector field and using uh, symmetry, uh, add invariance, then uh, we can actually solve this flow and study, and, and study the gradient flow lines explicitly. That's what we're about to do. So uh, we just set up the problem by calling M the degrees of freedom in SP1. So the Ms are varying with T and uh, let's, look at, uh, let, let's look at these fellows starting, if you choose a starting position at the uh, real unit in SP1, let's look at how this dynamics performs. Uh, Enrique? Yes. Um, are these critical points always minima? Aha, stability. <laughs> stability is coming yeah. right after. Okay, thanks. Fair question. Just, we're gonna get there. Uh, no, the general, the general answer is no, but you can find regimes that fit your 
that fit your 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 desires uh, by choosing our judicialism. Okay, so yes, well, we, we're going to look at this. You, you're always three slides ahead of me, uh, sort of. Anyway, um, so we, we can write the 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 divergence, the variation of divergence, sort of along the flow, in terms of these degrees of freedom, these these four functions, m i of t, they split into this coupled nonlinear system, but think about it long enough, you can find that you can organize this as a, as a, as a, as a nonlinear ODE, which is defined by an anti-symmetric matrix. And in that case, by Picard's theorem, we have long time existence. So you isolate your, the role of your choice of family here by the choice of R, and it's clear uh, visually that there will be special regimes. Uh, but the global dynamics, whichever R uh, you choose to go with, will be formally the same. And indeed, we can actually solve that thing and, uh, and look at the asymptotics of these, uh, which essentially become the asymptotics of the second component. Bear in mind, the second component is the one deciding whether you're at the equator or the poles, right? This, this second component is the is the, the special one, and uh, we can look at the limits of this solution. And what you find out is that the dynamics is essentially intertwined, depending on whether you choose your scale or your isometric class for R smaller or greater than one. So. Uh, Essentially, uh, the qualitative behavior of this dynamics is reversed when you cross this threshold of R equals one. When R equals one, it's stationary anyway. But when what, what I find interesting is that the uh, dynamic profile is reversed when you cross this threshold. So yeah. let's, uh, let's say this with fancy words. So when you set up the initial value problem I just described, then at very least along subsequences, uh, what you find is that the limiting uh, structures lie. Well, first of all, they are they they either at the equator or the poles, which means they're in particular harmonic and co-closed. But the more as the parameter r describing the isometric class you chose varies, uh, and I mean, and you have to look at the upper or lower hemisphere if you want to say something meaningful, right? So the dynamics in each of the hemispheres, let's say encoded by original sign of the second component, then it goes as follows on the three sphere. So when R is smaller than one, then gradient flows, uh, the, then the gradient flows from the equator to the poles. And when you cross one, it goes from the other way around, from poles to the equator. That's basically the dynamics you get on both on both hemispheres. Okay. So this is um, this is fascinating, I think. Uh, uh, and we, we don't have a um, a high profile explanation as to what's happening with this complete qualitative change when you cross this threshold, uh, this threshold of um, r equals to one. But essentially, the whole dynamics changes qualitatively, points the other way around. But now, uh, Jorge would wish to know more about the stability. So, are these actual minima? Uh, and indeed, uh, one can compute the second variation uh, uh, data for this problem. So, along variation vector fields, uh, uh, we're going to look at what happens with the Hessian. But then we should keep in mind, and that's another contribution we propose, we want to consider variation here, variations along homogeneous structures, right? So we want to consider homogeneous variations. And so uh, our, our conclusion, so for, for that, if you want to compute index and nullity of, uh, of the Hessian, you keep in mind what is a general conclusion about the gradient flow and, and uh, and, and what's relevant insofar as you're considering uh, 
homogeneous variations, right, of your structure. So uh, it's just computation. So if you want to compute the Hessian for the above, this can be done. And we can compute then uh, uh, um, uh, um, the Hessian explicitly in terms of these variations. The important thing here, as I, as I told you, is that we define the reduced quantities which describe variations along invariant, uh, along homogeneous structure, right? That's what, so, so then we have a notion of reduced energy, which is varying, but only among uh, homogeneous structures. And then accordingly, the reduced index and the reduced uh, nudity, um, um, meaning that you, you compute these, these dimensions only along homogeneous deformations. That's and then we have a notion of stability that's subordinate to this choice. So it's actually a reduced stability and reduced uh, index. So the notion, the good notion of stability Jorge is asking for is um, uh, index equal to zero and you call it unstable otherwise. But then again, by making all of these choices precise, we can then compute uh, first and second variation let me not do that. Life is too short. But uh, uh, one, one can compute explicitly uh, the torsion components and the full torsion tensor at each of the along each of the critical sets that we've detected before, and then at those compute the Hessian by using some special notation. Bear in mind that all the dependency essentially on R appears as this factor. So we want to try and see when things are going to be zero, some information coming from there. So the findings can be organized as follows. So bear in mind we have a threshold at R equals to one. So the qualitative behavior is expected to change when you cross this threshold. And what we find is that indeed uh, you have uh, stability here. So for, for R smaller than one, then these are indeed, then the poles are indeed minimal. Um, and, the whole, and the whole lot of additional information. Um, uh, so if, when R is bigger than one, then it, now it's the equator. It used to be a stable point, right? So we summarize this information here. So yes, uh, for, for R smaller than one, then the poles are gonna be stable. For R bigger than one, the equator is gonna be stable. And these stability profiles are reversed once you cross the, the, the threshold. There's some sort of global symmetry, right? That, that changes the qualitative nature of the problem as R crosses this standard threshold. Then in particular, the sort of corollary of this is that we can find lower bounds for the index uh, under those regimes and then automatically detect unstable fellows in the complementary situation. Right? Uh, so far, so we, we've been dealing with our ansatz in which all three eigenvalues of the square of a matrix D are the same. One could ask um, uh, what would happen if we choose two of them to be distinct, and then furthermore, if we choose the three of them to be distinct, well, then indeed, um, we, we, we can perform the above discussion in this sort of broader setting and also characterize the critical points in one way or the other by finding special pairs of poles and ultimately a circle. Uh, but in any case, um, the previous discussion and computations using the ansatz are already rich enough, uh, but it's straightforward, albeit perhaps tiresome uh, uh, um, task to do the same sort of in-depth analysis in terms of R1, R2, and R3 distinct, but it's perfectly doable. And then in this case, uh, in general, uh, um, we, we would have to study this dynamics from a sort of more sophisticated perspective. 
But that, that's that's basically what I want to say. You don't diagonalize everybody in terms of R as we did before. You can't factor out R. You have to deal with different uh, features uh, 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 corresponding to the roles of these different roles of these different eigenvalues. But it could be done. Furthermore, now uh, looking at the future, um, in the case of nearly parallel, meaning those two poles, for instance, for values of R greater than one, then uh, folks have been studying uh, uh, stability from a different sort of spinorial perspective. And they found uh, relative quantities to be this curl of this vector field and the curl of its curl. Um, by using our language, we can derive sort of naturally some inequalities relating the uh, norms of these quantities. Um, in particular, this could be thought of as a sort of Bochner type uh, situation in which we have some sort of Laplacian here, and then we can get some control and ultimately derive conclusions by arguing positivity, by imposing positivity in various or, or vanishing in several regimes. So this is a sort of curiosity in a way which ties in nicely with uh, investigation by Shubham and Ragini. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, are there any questions? Do you have your money? Come again? I'm getting some feedback from someone. I'm just... uh, hello? I think you can follow. Okay. I'm going to mute everyone, and then um, I'll ask you to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you also mute. Oh, are you are you unmuted now? Yeah. Now, um, oh, okay. So, well, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, are there questions? And, and please do unmute yourselves for questions. We're just trying to get rid of the feedback. Any questions? I, I was curious, you mentioned this, it sounds like an extremely difficult question of, are there any non-homogeneous G2 structures that give homogeneous metrics? I was just wondering what your guess might be on that. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, you're actually still muted. Maybe, 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 maybe Jorge has some insight on this. I would be very pleased to 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 have some indication in that way. But I would. I don't know. I, I never thought about it. Do you do you think this might go somewhere? Let me just situate the question, right? Um, the question seems to be good, but I never thought about it. So one way, well, okay, let, let, let me try and guess here. One way we, one could try and go about this is by adding some explicit non-homogeneity, say some radial function uh, uh, on, on the manifold that now is sensitive to how far you are from the origin, and then try and impose that that it remains in the same in the same isometric class um, as some original one, right? So you could deform it by some by some radial and non homogeneity. I think that 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 would be the first natural thing to do, right? What about for the flat metric on Rn? Uh, is it known? Well, the description of Rn as a homogeneous manifold is not very rich, right? 
I think you would want, I think you would want some non-trivial H to begin with, right? No, but I mean, on R7, analytically, I don't know, that try to construct the G2 with, with, the, with the flat metric. I don't know, maybe it's a PDE or something. Okay, so starting from RC, so you start from R7, to, uh, in, introduce some radio degree of freedom and then ask that, that it's still the flat metric? Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't work it out in my head, but I have a very strong feeling this will be trivial. Um, yeah, but I agree this would be the first one to try just to see how trivial it is, right? Um, um, yeah, but it, there, there's an open question. Uh, I, if people are interested in, in this question, I'll be, I'll be pleased to, to discuss it uh, in further detail. I, I agree it would be interesting. I, I would be very pleased to know the answer to this. And I think this would be the approach to propose some radio non-homogeneity and just look at what the equations are. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you, by the way. Are there other questions? If not, uh, thank you again for a very nice talk. Cheers. Um, our next talk is in two weeks. It'll be by Catherine uh, Catherine Searle.